Today I'm going to talk about identifying kernels that are within a convolutional neural network. So before I really get into convolutional neural networks and kind of how they work, I'm going to present the, the problem that we're going to have in the back of our mind that you should all remember, and whenever I, I show results or metrics, this is the problem we're talking about. So we're looking at image segmentation. We're looking at image segmentation on CT data. So looking at CAT scans, trying to identify livers, and then also liver cancer within these CT scans. So it's obviously an important problem for clinicians. It's helpful for them to know, is there cancer in a patient? But then also have that go into new treatment methods to try to quantitative methods that need information like volume or perfusion, things that are specific to the tumor. And we can only really get these types of data through segmentation. Now, to solve this problem, there are lots of ways to solve this problem. I'm going to start and introduce a second method, not convolutional networks, but a different method, one that we can analyze, something that Dr. Anston uh, brought up at the end of her talk, a method that we actually understand in its, all of its complexity. And that's the level set equations. My background is differential equations. So this is a partial differential equation that you can use to solve image segmentation problems. So how does this work? So you begin with some initial region. And there are three terms to this differential equation. Your first term is an outward expansion or diffusion term. So you have a region which involves in time. And as we go in time, we're going to evolve outwards. We're going to expand outwards based on some local information within the image. So we go from, say, time equals 200. It's an artificial time. It's not really seconds. But time from 200 to 500, we expand outwards. So now we're going to expand outwards in all directions. How did we know to stop and not necessarily cross these lines where there are clear image gradients? So the second term of the equation is a, it's a transport term. You're going to use image information and also gradient image information, things that tell you where the edges are in the image. So you're going to expand outwards. You're going to stop when you hit a wall. There's a third term of this differ differential equation, things which will give you nice, round, connected regions. So if we keep on expanding, we'll see at some point, instead of having sharp corners, right, so instead of having any sharp corners up here, we have nice, rounded edges. And that comes from a, a term that limits curvature for the third term in this differential equation. So in the end, so here we have limiting curvature. And at the end, we get some pretty good result. We have some region growing in time. And that region is governed by a differential equation called the level set equation. So that's great. We have a method. It works. We understand it. Why are convolutional neural networks so much, at least right now, receiving so much more attention? Well, so we have to actually solve these problems. On one hand, we can understand them. We understand the level set equation. We understand its stability. We understand all the numerical analysis that can go into studying this method because it's a differential equation. With that, we actually solve this using specific schemes that we know things about, like an upwind finite difference scheme and a fast marching method. I'll talk more about the upwind scheme later when I talk about neural networks. So, why don't we use these methods? Well, there's sort of two big drawbacks. One is they're semi-automated, right? You need that initial region. Finding your initial region is in many ways just as hard as finding your segmentation. If I know where to start, then I at least have some segmentation information for some pixels. These pixels are in my liver. These pixels are not. And that's how you get your, in your, your initial information. So that's just as hard a problem. The other problem that's just as hard is you need to have some good idea of which edges are important in your image. Right, so if we go back to our CT scan, there are many other edges in this image that are not associated with the liver. Edges that are associated to, say, muscle walls, or your spine, or for other CT segments, you have part of, I think, your heart in some of these images. Other, not all of these edges are important, whereas the level set equation is sort of agnostic to which information, which edges are important or not. Finding which edges are important is just as difficult as finding where are the edges of the liver in your region. So the me this method works, but requires more information than we assume we already have. So the level set equation, we can analyze it. It's great. It works sometimes. Convolutional networks work great, right? For, especially for many medical imaging problems. They're sort of the gold standard right now in how well they're working. However, we can't really, act, we can't really analyze them in any meaningful way. We treat them as black boxes. We train them, and we go. Eventually, we hand some model off to a clinician, and they use it with some degree of certainty, and they trust the results they get. It would be great if we had a method that we have both the ability to explain, such as we expand outwards, we're limited by edge gradients, 
were bound by curvature. Something we can explain, something that's a neural network that's just as good. And there's a trade-off that we're trying to get. So our goal is to create a method that is accurate that we can also analyze. So how are we going to do this? To do this, we're going to exploit some of the similarities between the level set equation and convolutional neural networks. So what are these similarities? These similarities rely on two parts of convolutional neural networks. We're going to start with the convolution operator in and of itself. So the convolution operator, some stencil, you're going to move it around, apply the same values to a bunch of to pixels, slide it over, do the same thing. So for example, a convolutional network, you're going to learn your kernels. But say finite differences is some kernel, you're applying a fixed stencil, not a learned stencil, but a fixed stencil everywhere in your image. And that gives you, say here, I, I, I demo with the uh, a stencil for the Laplace equation. right? But there's a, a finite difference stencil you apply everywhere. Just as for a convolutional network, you have some convolution operator that you're applying everywhere. Similarly, with convolutional networks, so we have the, our, our nonlinear functions, right? Our, I'm going to pick on ReLU, right? Everyone uses ReLU, or almost everyone uses ReLU, or variants of it now. But that's our activation function. That gives us the nonlinearity for many of our neural networks. We're going to apply our convolution operator at our bias. We're going to take the, the, the maximum of that with zero. So an upwind finite difference scheme, we can write in a very similar way. We're going to take two slightly different finite difference stencils. One weights information on one side, one weights information on the other side. We're going to apply the convolution with our finite difference stencil and pass that through maxes and mins. You can write, rewrite mins in terms of negative maxes. So this looks very similar to the activation functions that we use in our neural networks. We have an upwind finite difference scheme for the level set equation. And that's what we actually use for all the advanced toolkits that use the level set equation for segmentation. We have convolutional neural networks that do the same operations in somewhat different order. So can we exploit these similarities to construct a network that we can actually analyze just like the level set equation? So that's what we aim to do. We aim to build a convolutional neural network that looks a lot like the level set equation. So we're going to, take, we're going to call our result a level set network. We're going to discretize our PDE. We're going to make certain approximations that allow us to represent this as a convolutional neural network. Right? We're going to use an explicit, for those of you who do numerical analysis, it's an explicit uh, Euler uh, forward time step. But then those give us essentially skip connections, uh, residual connections across our network. Similarly, the upwind finite difference scheme gives us our, our, our layers, our, our activation functions, and our convolutions. So we're going to take our discretize equation. We're going to substitute out all the finite difference kernels and add in, go learn the optimal kernels. And then we're going to reframe our, our uh, activation functions similar with the max min type setup of the level set equation. We've taken the architecture of a numerical method to solve a level set equation and said that's our neural network architecture. Go learn what the right kernels should be. So we did this. We did this for our, our, our liver segmentation problem. So on our left, we have a level set equation, just implemented one of the basic uh, imaging toolkits. On the far right, we have uh, the what. Uh, kind of black box, uh, vanilla unit, nothing too tuned or fancy gets. So these are dice similarity scores between 0 and 1. One's a perfect match. Our method in the middle our, on our test set does much better than the level set equation. Not quite as good as a unit, but decent. No idea what happens on the second fold for a k-fold validation. I do put that out there. But even the unit doesn't do nearly as well on that. When we look at our, our validation set, though, we don't do as well as a neural network. So we had a great idea. At some point, this idea broke down. We trained really well, but we didn't validate really well. So there's something different that's going on between what we thought we could do and what a convolutional neural network actually does. So what does a convolutional neural network do? Right? What are the kernels that are UNet learned that are not what either the level set network learned or what the level set equation does? Are those kernels the same? Are they different? Are they similar? How do we make that comparison? And what about other kernels? We can start to think of, OK, does a convolutional neural network use some of these other kernels? Things that say, if you were to build a classifier, a random forest type method, if you do a bunch of these standard feature augmentation operations, like sharpen or blurring or, or local means, how do these methods compare? Are the kernels the same? Are they different? So to test this, here is the unit that we had before. I, I put this up here just because I'm going to reference some specific layer numbers later. 
but it's a pretty vanilla unit. We're gonna take the kernels that we learned from this unit. Our, we're gonna separate them into three by three slices, right, our three by three convolutions. Flatten them, call them a vector. That vector is data. We're gonna cluster that data, see where these clusters fall. Do they cluster near our numerical, our, our finite difference stencils? Do they cluster near any of these other image processing features? What are the kernels that a convolutional neural network learns? So we're gonna do this clustering, we're gonna make this comparison, and just to visualize, we're gonna visualize with PCA, nothing too fancy, something like TISNI or any of these other more complicated methods would be great, but we wanna have some representation that allows us to project the kernels that we know onto the same space to visualize, which rules out something like TISNI, you can't go back and add those results using kind of the basic toolkits. So we did this. So this is data. Each one of these dots is a three by three convolution slice. A lot of the, the kind of standard image processing kernels fall on top of each other in some region. This is layer 11, which is at the bottom of the unit that I showed earlier. This is still in the encoder half of the network. The colors here are k-means assignments. We've said k-means with k equals three. We only really have one big cluster here. The colors are pretty arbitrary. There's one big group in the middle and the colors don't tell us too much. And all of our standard image processing kernels at this layer sort of fall somewhere within these clusters. That's not the case for every layer. As we move into the decoder half of the network, the up part of our unit, we start to see some interesting patterns emerge within the kernels that we see. So all of the, the kernels that we sort of thought of using, our numerical analysis kernels, our finite difference kernels from the level set equation, our blurring and our mean operators, all the things that we normally do to images, fall in this little pocket of our space right here. Identity is all off on its own. Instead, we have all these other kernels that we are not able to identify in terms of the standard image processing operators that people use when they throw them in, into classification results. A convolutional neural network has more explainable power because of, this is our conjecture, because of these kernels. There are operations that it learns that are not similar to other things that we are doing. And this sort of result, this pocket with some swoosh attached, shows up at almost all, I think it's all of the other layers in the decoder half, from layer 13 through 18 to the end of our network on the original unit diagram that I had shown. This is interesting. In many ways, this brings up more questions than answers. Can we train data just to stay along some approximation of the space? Can we actually translate this into some clinical meaningful impact? They're great questions that we're trying to work out as we, we sort of delve into what's actually going on, what are these kernels that we haven't been able to identify before? To summarize, there are a couple main benefits from this work. One is that the level set equation is definitely not the same as a neural network. We, we've definitely, I think we'd all agree on that. But also any, any kind of hybrid method for the structure also doesn't give us the same information that we want. And sort of a bigger picture, we have this framework for talking about convolutions and ReLUs, components of a convolutional neural network, in the same language as talking about a partial differential equation, things which might be useful later on. It's not useful for our analysis, but is an interesting idea for people to think about in terms of how to approach explaining a neural network. And then the last piece is we've learned now that these convolutional kernels aren't the same across all the layers. There's this class of kernels that are very different that show up in the decoder part of a convolutional neural network that merit further exploration. With that, I want to thank KTY. I also want to thank the Gulf Coast Consortia for funding, and thank you very much. So we have time for one quick question. So how does... Uh, have you tried comparing it with the mask RCNN, for example? With a, can you repeat the question? Mask. With a mask CNN. RCNN, yeah. We, we haven't. So I will say the results that we have are very limited to our specific unit. We've looked at this for one or two other variants of the same architecture, but we haven't, we haven't had time to come back and look at some of these results yet. It's an excellent question. Do these change based on the architecture that you use? Right, units compared to say even just other, uh, not even just a mask, uh, a mask CNN or things like ResNet or VGG, any of these other type of methods for segmentation, how well do these results carry over? Great question, let's work on it. Thank you.